Well, hey guys, and welcome back to my channel. This is The Red Shadow, and I'm back with the next part of my top 30 favorite games of all time video series. Finally getting back to doing this. Um, so I am uh, on games, it'll be 20 through 16 in this video. And, uh, well, I guess we'll just go ahead and jump right on in. Um, so, this particular one, nah, I guess it doesn't really have more of a specific console to, to mention. There's a couple PS2 games in here, though. Uh, we're going to be hitting up some of my favorites from that generation. And we're going to start off with the second Mortal Kombat game on my list. Mortal Kombat Trilogy being the first. And... On my list right now, number 20 is Mortal Kombat Deception. I also forgot something I needed to do here. There we go. So this is Mortal Kombat Deception uh, for PlayStation 2. This is the premium pack. And I don't know a lot of glare because of how dark and shiny this cover is. But this premium pack has a Sub-Zero on the front of it. Here's a look at the back, and as you can see, this is a double pack uh, edition. But what this has in it is just a standard version of the game, standard PS2 copy, um, which this one doesn't have a, a guide in it. Um, I'm going to tell a story about this particular, this premium pack and how I got it and stuff. Um, this is the second one with the kind of shiny cover for it. Inside this one, no no manual, but the second disc came along and what this was was some additional content. On the disc was an exclusive arcade perfect playable version of Mortal Kombat 1 25 character video bios including Mortal Kombat Team Commentary and an in-depth history of the Mortal Kombat franchise. Uh, and this version of the, the game is supposed to come with a serialized collector's edition metal trading card. Now when I bought this, I want to say like 8 or 9 years ago, um, it was 8 bucks plus shipping on eBay. Now, I don't know exactly what it would range now, but at that time, I wasn't aware of, uh, oh, you know, there might be some extra thing that's packed into a game like this. So I just bought it, and when it came in, I looked and I noticed, you know, it didn't have instruction manuals, it didn't have the card, and later on, I found the premium disc has got... I don't know if it'll be easy to see on here or not, but there's a crack in there that uh, this game doesn't play. It has never played in my PS2, and I contacted the seller of this game and said, hey, this second disc was cracked, and I got a story about how it wasn't his game. He was selling it for his brother or something like that, and he was sorry about that. And uh, but he did bring it to my attention that I only paid eight dollars plus shipping, and I really couldn't be upset at the time. I didn't well, no, I don't know when I got this other thing I'm going to show, but it just didn't. It wasn't worth it to me. Plus, unless I really got ripped out, ripped off of a like a lot of money, I don't think I would ever really dispute an eBay purchase uh, over something like that. Uh, not when the main disc, you know, uh, for the game itself was still intact. Like I said, it wasn't expensive, and I don't think these are really all that expensive now. So I could get a replacement pretty easily. Uh, but speaking of the other thing I was going to show, I also have this Mortal Kombat collection that comes with Deception, Shaolin Monks, and Armageddon, all in one box set. This is from... Uh, my days at uh, Walmart, you know, obviously the PS2 days, but this was also not very expensive, and it gave me Shaolin Monks and Armageddon, both of which are games that I enjoy, but I don't remember how much I talked about uh, Trilogy and specific details about that. 
about how that was the game that I loved because of the fighting and being with my friends and couch co-op or couch combat. But by the time I got to Deception, I had moved away and I didn't have people that I played the game with. And uh, so the fighting game aspect of it had lost its shine and its luster for me. But what I did love in Deception, what blew me away and was a huge shock, was a mode that was called Conquest Mode, which was basically like uh, a 3D adventure, you know, action adventure game set in Mortal Kombat's universe, taking you to the different realms, Earth Realm, Nether Realm, Outworld, etc. Uh, you play as a it's it's like a big tutorial mode, but it's so in depth, like it blows beyond just teaching you how each different character fights and how to fight against them and how to fight as them. The character that you play in the game, I don't even remember his name. Uh, I think he becomes a playable character in the game or something. Uh, but none of that mattered to me. It was just being in the world of the of the Mortal Kombat universe and meeting NPCs and doing things for them. Uh, there's shit tons of collectibles everywhere these colored crypt coins that allow you to go into the crypt once you've uh, accumulated a bunch and unlock things. Uh, but also, the game has a, the conquest mode has a day, night, and time sequel, uh, time uh, aspect to it. A cycle, I guess that's the word I was struggling to find there for a moment. It's a day, night, and time cycle that you, you progress through a, the week, you know, Monday through Sunday, and if you're in certain realms at certain times of the day, on a certain day, sometimes even a certain day of the week or the month, something will spawn and appear. It might be a, a hidden character that you fight against. It might be a, a chest that opens up and has a specific item in it. It was just so cool how much time and care they put into this mode that in some games it might have been a throwaway. You know, a lot of those Mortal Kombat games on the PS2 came with additional modes, uh, chess games, kart racing games, and there were other, I don't remember if it was Deadly Alliance or Armageddon, but one or the other of them also had like a Conquest mode, but it was nowhere near as awesome as a Conquest mode on Mortal Kombat Deception. And that mode alone is the reason why this game even shows up at all on my list. The fighting game part, like I said, I didn't care. I, I really lost a desire to play fighting games by even by the time that this came out and I just have a loyalty I guess to Mortal Kombat that I still buy all the Mortal Kombat games and rarely ever play them because the fighting thing just doesn't do it for me <clears throat> um, the Shaolin Monks game felt to me like maybe building a game from that conquest mode but it just it still didn't have the right feel to it I, I didn't really like the Shaolin Monks game all that much. Armageddon was awesome because it had all of the characters up to that point and all the levels. It was like the PS2 version of like Mortal Kombat Trilogy 2.0. But like I said, nothing in any of those games even came close to how much fun that I had exploring the, the, the Mortal Kombat universe in the conquest mode of deception. Like I just can't say it enough it's if there was any reason why i would want to see some of these old ps2 games get remastered and brought to the new consoles it's so that i could play something like mortal kombat deceptions conquest mode with a slightly cleaned up graphical style and and you know on a, on a more modern day console than than the ps2 but you know i still have my ps2 and can play it whenever i would want to it would just be so awesome to see it brought to today, you know, because Mortal Kombat Deception came out, when was that? This is showing 2004, which is about when I thought it was, but like I said, number 20 on my all-time favorite games list, Mortal Kombat Deception, and pretty much solely for the Conquest mode, and there's probably a bunch of other stuff in that game that other people would love, but uh, like I said, it just comes down to that for me. So we'll move on to game number 19 and another PlayStation 2 game. Another one of my all-time favorites from back in those days. And this game is Downhill Domination. A downhill BMX or mountain biking racing game. 
that uh, does uh, speed and tricks and like melee combat all mixed into one game like you wouldn't believe I, it's maybe a little bit of a stretch to say it's sort of the burnout three takedown of downhill biking games but then there aren't a lot of downhill biking games to begin with but when somebody comes along and does them as good as this game was done by Incog Inc uh, and, and published by Sony like I don't know this game impresses me on so many different levels like I mentioned there's the speed of it you're on a bike and the speed is incredible and it feels incredible when you're racing in this game now it's not meant to be you know f f uh, it's not meant to be uh, completely authentic physics one to one or anything like that it's it's craziness but you also still can crash and burn when you're racing down the the mountain uh, in a game like this I don't remember if I showed the back but there it is again um, and as you're racing down the mountain, you're also pulling off tricks. You can hit ramps and do jumps and then perform tricks while you're in the middle of them. And if you don't land them, then you're going to crash and burn. But if you do, you're earning points. You are in a race, though, from a, you know, a start to a finish line. But every race is just down the hill. No, no laps, no doing the same track multiple times uh, until you hit the, the final lap and win. It's go from the top of this mountain all the way down to the bottom. And there's the melee aspect, so you can knock your opponents off their bikes and, and cause them to lose ground. Uh, but the thing that always impressed me the most, despite loving everything I just mentioned, the thing that impressed me the most, and maybe time has altered my memory, the 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 of just how correct my memory is of this, but I remember... The, the race is taking so much longer than you ever thought a race like this should take. As I mentioned before, a lot of racing games of all types have a, a, a track that's a, a loop of some sort. Whether it's circular or has a lot of twists and turns, you go past the start line and it's now it's lap two and now it's lap three. And most of those games still have races that end within a couple of minutes. In the downhill dominations uh, races, at least in some of the modes there's a lot of different modes i couldn't even list them all off for you but in the particular modes that i always played those races going all the way down the hill from the from the very top of whatever mountain or or uh environment they stick you in which can be mountains snow snow top mountains uh tracks that'll take you through cities and and uh you know uh I want to say like I wanted to say rivers but I don't think they had rivers but like creeks trees you name it all sorts of terrain it I feel like those those races always took six seven eight minutes maybe longer from start to finish and because of the the way the terrain changes because of all your competitors around you because of the melee abilities the tricks there's power-ups that you can hit along the way. Some of them boost your speed, and you, you're just you're just flying. And then you're trying to make sure that you land and don't crash or go off a cliff or something like that. It never leaves you bored. It never feels stale. It's never like, my God, when is this race going to end? Um, I, I felt a lot of anxiety for sure if I wasn't doing good in a race. But, man, I always still felt compelled to go you know, top to bottom and see it all the way through. So that's just, it's just a kind of fun and a kind of gameplay that I don't play a lot or didn't back then and still don't now. And I just love it. And, and this is another game that I would love to see. And maybe it is. I, I don't really pay much attention to the PS2 to PS4 digital library, but maybe some of these games are already on there, and I could play them on my new console. I think it's going to be something I'll have to look into. But this is another game that I would love to see show up on like the PS4 uh, to be able to play it again. And, and this one, as opposed to Mortal Kombat, which I wouldn't want to do online, if there was online for this, I would jump in 
like head first to to be able to play this on a newer console online against other people that would be tremendous fun downhill domination that's my number 19 game on my list and now we're going to jump to the next ps2 game in this one my number 18 favorite all-time game this is mercenaries playground of destruction from pandemic studios and lucas arts uh, pandemic studios is a very unfortunate studio name nowadays but pandemic studios doesn't exist any longer so i guess it's uh, lucky for them that they weren't dealing with that. But Mercenaries Playground of Destruction is easily summed up, in my opinion, as Grand Theft Auto uh, military game, Grand Theft Auto uh, war game, or Grand Theft Auto Korea, as a, this game takes place in North and South Korea. It is a uh, about a military uh uh, instance that's going on but you're not a part of the war on any particular side you're a mercenary although you are trying to go against the evil regime um, I don't want it to make it sound like you can take jobs for whatever side you want to you are still against the protagonist excuse me the antagonist of the game but you're not necessarily uh, you know it's not necessarily a US patriotic thing you're just in it for the money. Uh, I'm just going to read the little snippet here on the back. Uh, you are a lethal mercenary. Your mission is to topple a sinister military regime by any means necessary. If it drives or flies, you can hijack it. If it shoots or explodes, you can use it as a weapon. You're free to go anywhere, destroy anything, and blow the crap out of everything. In this play, you're under destruction. There are no limits, no barriers, and no mercy. So you've got the three mercenaries here on the front. You select one of them and you you know you go into this uh, military playground and like I said it's like Grand Theft Auto in that you run around third person you have guns you can get into vehicles like it said you can get into choppers you can get into planes you can get into tanks military trucks regular vehicles driving around the the world to get where you need to go um, I want to say that after the events of 9/11 and and the uh, pursuit of you know stopping terrorism and pursuing terrorist cells all across the world, at some point I recall uh, some some I don't know if it was you know the United Nations type thing or particularly the U.S. Uh, were were calling certain groups of terrorists like a, a deck of cards and you had the four suits and then you had all of the the ace and the kings and the queens jacks and the numbered cards um in this game they do that i like i said i'm pretty sure they borrowed that from an actual real world uh example uh and in this one you've got the four suits and then you have you know like higher level military officers up at the top and then lower level ones going down the numbered cards and you're tasked with taking care of all of those so 52 or maybe 53 with a joker involved like as the top one or something i don't remember any of that in particular um but it you know this was before trophies or anything but it still gave you something because i think you could either kill or capture and turn in any of those cards you would get a smaller reward if you just killed them you would get a higher reward if you were able to actually incapacitate them um, and and turn them in while they were still alive and there may have been a few of them that you are particularly tasked with either just kill them or just capture them i don't remember but i remember trying to capture every single one that i could without killing them and uh, being super frustrated with a few of them. I'm not sure though if I ever captured all of them across the board, or at least all the ones that you uh, could, uh, in, in, in case I'm remembering correctly about being able to, or having to just kill some of them. The details are, are 
not so uh, fresh for me because I haven't played the game in a long time, but it's always stuck with me how much fun it was. The, the world was, especially for the time, once again, this is a game that came out in 2005, apparently. So at the time, um, you know, aside from like the GTA games, I hadn't seen a lot of really big open world games like this to, to run around and play, play in, Playground of Destruction. But unlike a Grand Theft Auto game where you're getting some guns and maybe a rocket launcher or something, this game included some mega guns and mega weapons that allowed you to, to commit like all kinds of major destruction. Haha, it's all built into the name of the game, right? And my favorite one was a, a gun that was, or an, a weapon, I don't know if it was a gun, a weapon that was called the Bunker Buster. I think what it did was it allowed me to point at a certain building and then call in like a missile strike and that missile would shoot down from the plane or whatever that was that was launching it from above and then it would seem like it missed or it was a dud because you'd see it hit the building but nothing would happen immediately what it was actually doing was that bunker buster was going down underneath and inside of it and then blowing up from the inside now, destruction in games has come a long way nowadays, and, and newer games, more modern games, do destruction like you just so accurate and so amazingly intricate. Um, in this game, destruction was not the the graphics and the capabilities of PS2 weren't enough to be that micro managed, but. The Bunker Buster would literally take down almost any building on the map. Whereas if you took a, a regular rocket launcher and launched it at a building, it's not going to do that kind of damage. But that Bunker Buster could annihilate a building. And if you beat the game, I believe when you beat the game and went back in to play it again, you'd have access to the Bunker Buster with unlimited ammo for the whole entire game. In your first game, you could acquire it at some point, usually later in the game, but then you could take it with you into the next game and just cause massive chaos. So I used to have fun playing the game to the end and then being like, now I'm just going to go into the world and just fuck around with this and just blow everything I can up just to see what I can do. And it was so awesome. I just loved it. It's, a, like I said, a particularly close game to my heart. Um, at that time, the PS2 was really getting me through things in my life, and that's why there's a lot of PS2 games on this list. Um, and this was one of those that I just have such fond memories of sitting down and blowing everything up and just causing a bunch of chaos. So, it's up there for me. Uh, number 18. That was number 18 on the list. Let's move right on into number 17, a little bit more of a recent game. Um, and something I talked about in the video where I talked about the games I've played this year since the beginning of the year up till now. But I can talk about this probably a little bit more now. That's Red Dead Redemption 2 from Rockstar. Uh, Rockstar's first and only game completely designed and built for this gen of consoles, PS4 and Xbox One. Um, and, I mean, what can I say about this? The first Red Dead uh, is a game I really, really loved, but Red Dead 2 took everything about that game to another level. First of all, it built off of the story in the first Red Dead. This is a prequel that so gives you a little bit more insight into John Marston and the, and the gang that he was a part of. But you don't play as Marston in this one, you play as Arthur Morgan. And that allows you to see things from another perspective. And it allows you to see the power of what they were able to do on this game. The the camp that you're, uh, that you're a part of, the gang, everybody sees the gang as like a handful of people. There was a lot of advertising that showed a, this group of seven that's on here, but the camp itself was like 20 people or more, uh, all doing different, doing and providing different uh, purposes and roles, and you engage with everybody throughout this game, so you get to know your main character, all the main core 
uh, members of the Dutch Vanderlyn gang, including Dutch himself, and a lot of other people who were a part of the game that weren't necessarily gunslinging outlaws, but still did their part to, uh, you know, benefit the whole entire group. It's just, this is why I love story games so much nowadays. Narrative-heavy games, whether they're open-world games like this, whether they're decision-based games like Telltale, whether they're like an indie game that tells a really uh, charming and, and heartwarming story, anything that allows me to like live in a world and learn about its people and what everything that's going on with it, those are always going to rate high on my list. That's why Red Dead is in here at number 17. Um, I, I don't know. It's, it's a newer game, so I figure people watching this probably know about this a little bit more, so I won't spend too much more time on it, but it's well worth playing. Especially like if you like the first game. Alright, number 16 on my list, the last game to cover in this video is a PC game. We're back to another point-and-click PC game. I covered Phantasmagoria Puzzle of Flesh in an earlier video. This is the second one on my list. This box isn't going to probably tell you much unless you know the game that this box is for. But maybe you'll be able to read this. This is Riven, the sequel to Myst. Myst, the old uh, 90s PC game, point and click, <clears throat> may not have been the first, but it was. It definitely popularized the genre, and perhaps it was the first. But point and click, as I mentioned before, um, you get a you get a screen, and with objects on the screen, not like a, uh, not not the uh, hidden object style game where you're just trying to find something hidden there, but you mouse over things and you can certain things you can manipulate, or access or grab or whatever, uh, and then you'll usually have like arrows on the screen, left and right, up and down that that you move forward or backwards or right or left and to explore more of the environment. Uh, and these games are usually heavy on the puzzle aspects. Here's the uh, manual for the game. And like the Phantasmagoria game, there's five discs in this, five discs total uh, that you need to, to play through the game. And this here in my hands, this one right here, this is my original copy. This is the copy I've had for more than 20 years. For some reason, I can't get the manual back in there, so we'll put it up here on the front. But this is the same copy that I've had since the late 90s that I'm not even sure that my current computer could play but I've kept it all these years. But recently, a few years back, I went on eBay and I got the actual big box PC version of this. <clears throat> I have to admit that these things are big and cumbersome and kind of hard to display, but they're freaking cool, man. They're, these big old boxes are, man, they show you so much on them. And I remember when I lived in Montana, this is where I was when this game came out and when I got to play it. And I used to shop at a place that was called uh, Software Etc. Uh, they were basically one of a couple little stores that merged and became GameStop that we all know today. Uh, but this Software Etc. was in the mall uh, in Missoula, Montana, where I used to live. And I used to go in there all the time with my friends. And we used to be looking for PS1 games, Nintendo 64 games, um, you know, Sega Saturn games. Uh, but they always had a little section of the big box PC stuff. And I would look at this stuff because at that time I didn't have a computer. Or for, for most of the mid to the late 90s, I had a computer, but it they never worked right. We had a My dad and I had a lot of issues with buying janky computers and having major issues dealing with the place that sold them to us. And so it really wasn't until I got my first real, my first real home PC that I was able to use in, I think it was early 1999 from Gateway, the old uh, cow, pa cow 
textured or cow pattern box from back in the day, white and black. Uh, but the years prior to that, I used to just look at games like this in those stores and just sort of wonder, like, man, I, I wish that was something I could play. I, I, I don't have a computer that would run it, but I look at the little screens on the backs of these boxes and I'm like, this stuff is really, really interesting looking and elaborate and beautiful. Um, I, don't know, I finally got a computer and was able to play that stuff. I went all in. That's why I have some very particular favorite games, and you'll get to see uh, at least one or two more PC games uh, in in some of these future installments. Just real quick while I'm talking here, inside of this box that I bought off of eBay is that same packaging like the one I showed before, but this one's still sealed. I assume it's still the original seal, but maybe it's a reseal. doesn't really matter. I really just wanted this one for the big box and to have it, uh, you know, in my collection. I'm going to show this stuff here before I go back to talking about the game. Like, here's a, a sheet of paper that is a order form for the official Riven Hints and Solutions Strategy Guide that I am like 99% sure I own. Uh, and I, I thought about showing my strategy guides on these videos, but I'm actually going to do collection videos for my strategy guides in the near future. So uh, I didn't include it to show here, but there was an order form in here for a strategy guide. Here's an, uh, the Journeyman Project 3 Legacy of Time. There's like an advertising here. There's a demo, according to this, on the first disc. I'm not 100% sure... If I ever paid any attention to that on my copy. What do we have here? A Riven sequel to miss additional Riven information. Supporting Riven. So internet and phone contact material. Updating drivers. Just some information like that uh, about the game. Here's a sheet for missed merchandise. T-shirts and other things. Books. A lot of books. Hats. Man, that'd be cool to have. And then the last thing, last two things, a Broderbund troubleshooting uh, guide. Broderbund might be the publisher. And here's a, the Broderbund software registration card. Like, this is all in, in you know, relatively great condition. For this big box that's why like i said that's kind of why i wanted it because it was i didn't have the foresight back in the day to hold on to my damn big box pc games and then of course like n64 games back when i had super nintendo games i never kept any of these boxes only ever kept boxes for you know things like this because it's plastic and it's part of the protection on on the packaging i didn't see it that way back in the day with the cardboard boxes. So anyway, back to Riven, the sequel to Myst. Myst, old 90s PC game, point and click, adventure, puzzles, difficult puzzles in my opinion. I always struggled on the Riven puzzles. Excuse me, that's why I was always glad to have the strategy guide to help me through when I needed it. But Riven was the sequel to come back, and there's a immensely detailed and convoluted lore to the Mist series and there's several Mist games. I think there's like a total of five and then there's remakes of uh, Mist and there's like a game called Real Mist and there's been a lot of stuff. I think there's like a VR Mist now uh, and there was some sort of, I, I'm almost positive in the last couple of years I saw where multiple people could go into some sort of a Mist experience and play at the same time, like a multiplayer Mist. Uh, but it's not necessarily the Mist game. I think it's it's literally meant for you to be able to go into sort of like a Mist-related museum and look at things. But you do it with other people in VR, or maybe it's just one or the other. But uh, it was really cool when I saw somebody once playing it online. A wrist was a wrist. Riven was the sequel to the first Miss game and continued the story. Um, 
I just thought the the jump in the visuals and the technology that was at play from Mist to Riven was stunning to me. And Mist, I tried to play it a few times, and I was just like, yeah, this is kind of interesting, but I want something a little bit more engaging, and I want something that's a little more impressive. And Riven was impressive, and I'm sure the games after it were really cool. I've never really played much of the other games. It's a, whether I've mentioned on this channel in anything or not, there are times when I latch on to a specific installment in something so much that I'm afraid to play the other things around it. It happens to me with a lot of musicians where I only listen to like one album that they did and I'm, it's so good to me that I'm, I'm afraid to listen to something else. Uh, Riven has kind of been that way for me, but I do want to get all the other games. I believe I have... Um, I believe I have the third game in the Myst series on PlayStation 2. But like I said, I think there's something like five altogether. And last year, the year before, or maybe it's been a couple years now, there was a Kickstarter for a PC bundle that had all of the, the games together. But because it was going to cover everything, physical discs and really elaborate physical packaging it was it was not going to be cheap and i just couldn't afford to do it then but i'm going to be keeping my eyes open for the possibility of maybe picking that up later on down the road if it's not god awfully expensive um so anyway i keep getting away from talking about the game itself it's just point and click very elaborate environments more detailed there's some full motion video parts in the game where you'll encounter somebody and talk to them. But these games are very, very stark and, and you feel very alone when you play in these games because you don't it's more like you're you're in some place where there's trees and the ocean. Riven takes place on an island where you're basically uh, uh, near the start of it. You're kind of like by the ocean. You'll get a little bit more interior of the land but you're always close by to the water. Um, and the traversal takes you through wooded areas, and there's one part where you're like in a little village, very kind of primitive-ish feeling village. Um, and I don't know, it's just, it's a game you have to almost kind of see to believe, and you kind of need to see it to see if it would be a game that you would want to even attempt to, to play for yourself. But I think it's well worth it. But like I said, I warn people, those puzzles are crazy hard um, unless you're just a freaking genius I am not uh, I could see some people who are really good with solving stuff might might get into it but that wasn't me but yeah anyway that's that's game number 16 on my top 30 games uh, of all time my top favorite I like to pound that point home that these are my favorite games not the games I think are the best uh, but they're my top 30 favorite games. That was number 16. And I'll be back very, very soon with the next video where we'll go from 15 to 11. And, uh, and then we'll be continuing on from there. So thanks a lot for watching, and uh, we'll see you next time.